Hello, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics video number 10. Uh, this is, uh, my name is Robert Distinti. Uh, if you want to know more about Ethereal Mechanics, there's an introduction video, which is video number one. That's EMV001. Today we're going to talk about epochs of Mother Nature. And this is kind of a continuation of the last video. And uh, toward the end, we're going to transition into a conjecture of our own existence. Previously, we talked about what an epoch was. Uh, an epoch is just a way of looking at uh, how everything fits together in our, uh, our ability to, to organize things. For example, um, from a simple adder, you can, you can get a subtractor, and of course an adder uh, carries along. From integer subtract and integer addition, you can do integer multiplication and division, and also these get carried along. Um, and then, so each one of these are an echelon, and as you go up the epoch, the complexity goes toward infinity. As you go down the epoch, the things become very, very, very simple. Uh, from this computer simulation, then, we can plug in a universe simulation, because from computer math, we can do simulations. Uh, we're going to get to this in a little bit. <clears throat> so the key point I want to make is as you go down the epoch, things should become simpler. As you go up the epochs, things should become more complex. Each one of these lines I call an echelon. They're not tightly defined. It's a loose, def yeah, the echelon is a loosely defined structure. I mean, this whole thing is loosely defined, but it kind of puts things in perspective. Okay, then what we could do is we can then butt computer math into a, a, see how this butts into a previous echelon and this echelon would be let's say would be NMOS integrated circuits because as you recall we did this uh, using a Z80 microprocessor an NMOS Z80 microprocessor and uh, this add uh, integer hardware can be done uh, is can be constructed from much simpler gates which would be NAND and NOR NOR all these various logic gates so the average person may not know what those are, but they're actually quite simple. And actually, in fact, with just either a NAND or an, uh, a NOR function, you can actually synthesize the rest of these gates. Just like you can synthesize all of these other mathematical functions from addition, you can do the same thing here, but I did not show that. Uh, but then these basic logic gates are created from the basic NMOS components, a PNP transistor, an NPN transistor, yada, yada, yada. Again, as you go down the epoch, things become simpler and simpler. Let's look at life for a moment here. Okay, all life can be derived, uh, mapped into four DNA base pairs. And I'm not going to cover all these. You can read what these are. But every all possible plants and animals that exist on the Earth um, are are mapped by four DNA base pairs. That's like an amazing thing that four DNA base pairs can describe all the life on this planet to ad, ad infinitum. Um, and if somewhere out of this infinite life possibilities, we get civilization. That would be us. And so let's plug this into, let's go down to chemistry physics. All the infinite molecules that exist in chemistry, okay, can be derived from, are composed of just 100 uh, stable elements. Those 100 stable elements are comprised of just four, uh, three uh, particles and some forces. And so what's, what happens down here? Shouldn't it be simpler as we go down the epoch? Well, down here, what quantum mechanics says is we got this plethora of particles now. So now we've gone from a few to many. So that's kind of like a reverse. That's, like a, that's kind of a problem. Uh, but let's not cover that in a second. Let's go over here to this note here. Um, it's amazing to me, this is something that bothers me, is of all the infinitesimal, uh, the, I'm sorry, infinitesimal, all of the infinite chemical combinations possible, why is there only one genetic code? I mean, shouldn't there be something with silicon or other uh, DNA, forms of DNA? Why is there only one? That, or maybe that's the only one we know of? I don't know. Um, and, and now the other thing, this definition here for cosmology, this co cosmology is probably just an extension of this epoch. Okay, I'm just showing it as a little subset here when it's probably the whole thing just continuing. So this is just a shorthand notation because it's easier to show this than to show the entire universe um, 
as containing all this plus. All right, so let's get back to this. Um, so how are we going to deal with this over here? I mean, obviously, even though I do not agree with the theory of quantum mechanics, we can't ignore the observations that were made, and these particles are basically observed phenomenon. Uh, so how do we fit all this together? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to plug the chemistry into a particle physics echelon, where we're going to predict all of these particles here, which means it has to be infinite number of particles that can be predicted by what comes before. And then ethereal mechanics is going to be the, we're going to derive all these particles plus the proton, electron, neutron, and, and higher, heavier elements from uh, ethereal mechanics. And this is going to be derived just from two particles plus ether, where all forces are just states of the ether, and that's going to be new electromagnetism version 5. Um, the reason why we're doing that, and another reason why I do not have faith in quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics does not describe gravity. There is no consideration of gravity. Therefore, it cannot possibly be a theory of everything until it describes gravity. Relativity describes gravity, but little of any other particles. So there's a big disconnect between relativity and quantum mechanics, or this, I guess, may be called the standard model, uh, where I'm going to show you with ethereal mechanics, we can do the entire gamut of all th of the, you know, the entire epoch, because really, this is is a superset of this, and this is a superset continuation. Really, just really should call this the universe. So I'm just showing them like this as three echelons. I mean, uh, as three epochs connected together just for simplicity. Because to draw a horn that keeps on going out like this, where each one of these are an echelon, is kind of a uh, difficult thing to show. So now, how does this all fit together? Well, okay, so we have our particle physics echelon bumping into our chemistry echelon, which off comes our universe or cosmology echelon, but then bumped into here's our life, which evolves into civilization, which evolves into computer science, which goes to simulations. And so what happens is you can take this paper, rotate it around, and bump simulation into particle physics. That way there, if we have the correct theory of everything, then we should be able to simulate everything through particle physics, chemistry, life, civilization, computer science to the point where this entire simulation is able to predict the same models that we have come up with. This would be a very good check that we have the right models to the theory of everything. But now there's an interesting caveat. This is where the conjecture begins. So if we do run such a uh, simulation, this simulation must be able to predict its own derivation. And then the simulation would necessarily become self-aware. I mean, if we're a simulation, the mere fact that we exist and are struggling to understand our place in the universe uh, is a condition of the universe becoming self-aware. So when the simulated beings derive the same theory of everything and run their own simulation, we can be reasonably sure we have the correct theory of everything. So to make the simulation practical, because one of the problems we run into is there's infinite possibilities over every echelon here. Um, you know, so we want to kind of limit this thing so we can actually get to a solution within our lifetime on the computer simulation. So we're going to limit the simulation. Okay, we're going to limit to a single ideal planet and use the same genetic model we have. Uh, the sentient beings that evolved would see the universe as we see it, however, what they see would just be a projection in the distant universe since it might not be efficient to simulate the entire universe. And they would be the only life in the simulated universe. Why, why complicate their life with meeting other civilizations? And further cut corners, we would probably begin the simulation at the dawn of civilization, just prior to the advent of written language. And therefore, the entire fossil record of the planet would actually be correct, but it would have to, it, it would be implemented um, up to that point, it'd be like an initial condition, but it would never actually have happened. This is kind of the idea from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, or is it the universe? I can't remember. Okay, uh, but then things become interesting. When the simulated beings develop the theory of everything and observe their own simulated universe, might they then surmise that they might themselves be a simulation and began to look for their creator? What then? Well, since the simulation is running on a super powerful computer, where a thousand years of simulation time may pass in perhaps one minute of our time, then the simulation would learn much faster than we. So out of fear, would we pull the plug and murder all the sentient elements of the simulation? Eh, perhaps not.
scientists develop the theory of everything and observe their own simulated universe, might they then surmise that they might themselves be a simulation and began to look for their creator? What then? Well, since the simulation is running on a super powerful computer, where a thousand years of simulation time may pass in perhaps one minute of our time, then the simulation would learn much faster than we. So out of fear, would we pull the plug and murder all the sentient elements of the simulation? Eh, perhaps not. Interesting, because we are the observers and controllers of the simulation, we are both omnipotent and omnipresent. We can change anything we want, even change the rules. We can even pause the simulation. And because we have the ability to pause the simulation and look at any part of it, we can pass judgment over the entire lives of any simulated being. I mean, this is starting to sound familiar, right? Uh, and we can even take samples uh, 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 or make copies of the simulated beings and give them eternal life free from want. I mean, we can create any kind of universe for these beings that we may take samples of. Um, but we have a problem because in order to keep the simulation on track to um, get to an end game without you know, going down any of the blind infinite alleys that we could possibly go down, um, we have to communicate with the simulation. Because of the time difference, we would have to buffer communication and give bursts of communication every thousand years or so. It's like watching videos over a slow internet connection. So to improve the interaction, uh, it would be more efficient to create simulated beings uh, that would interact within the speed of the simulation. We could call them liaisons, call them angels, call them whatever you want. They would have powers a little bit above what the normal simulated beings would happen, this could become a problem and could lead to the concept of a fallen angel. I mean, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, but it gets better. Since we need to simulate beings to derive the theory of it, since we need the simulated beings to derive the theory of everything on their own, we cannot let the angels interfere too much. The angels should only do things to facilitate the simulated creatures driving the theory of everything, short of actually giving it to them. Because remember, we want them to come up with it on their own. Okay, so the angels would act to prevent the beings from blowing themselves up in a nuclear war, thereby prematurely ending the simulation. Um, to that end, we would instruct the simulated angels to prevent the simulated beings from stagnating, because we're in a hurry to get an answer, obviously. The angels would facilitate the following. Do not prevent totalitarian governments. Do not allow utopian society, because we don't want people getting fat, dumb, and happy and not doing anything. Um... But we didn't want the beings to suffer enough to make their lives better. We want them to suffer enough to keep the, fi keep the fire burning in their hearts so that they can get to that theory of everything. If we make things too difficult, they're going to give up hope. Um, and we obviously have to strike a balance between war and peace. Uh, we don't want a too peaceful society. We don't want a too warfare society. And so probably what we would do is fragment the people by language, by culture, by religion even to keep enough uh, chaos in the world so that uh, the search for uh, a better existence will always be uh, pushing them ahead. And to that end, we'd probably not care how horrible the simulated beings are to each other as long as they're progressing toward a theory of everything. Okay, but ultimately, when they find the theory of everything, what then? Do we stop the simulation and end the lives of all the simulated beings? Or do we pass judgment on all the simulated beings who have ever lived and choose some who have lived exemplary lives and invite them to live eternally? La -da -da. Um, and even in Futurama, uh, episode 3, season tw I'm sorry, season 3, episode 20, Godfellas, which won a Writer's Guild Award, they came up with the concept, uh, and this is they actually put the, the key picture on the covers of all of the uh, discs for the series, um, that they made a reasonable argument about the role of God. If you do too much, people become dependent on you. If you do too little, people will destroy themselves. If you need a light touch. If you do things right, people won't be sure you've done anything at all. And that's uh, interesting that a cartoon would come up with an interesting uh, philosophical argument about uh, a creator. Okay, so basically as a recap, uh, we can show you that things have to get simpler as we go down the echelon. And ultimately, if we come up with a simulation, that simulation should be able to derive itself and become self-aware. That would be a good test that we have a correct theory of everything. And then we get into the interesting conjecture of what happens when we actually run a simulation to see if it will predict itself. Um, that's going to be an interesting day when we look at that. Uh, anyway, uh, next is going to be video 11. We're going to recap the rules of acquisition and pain. And then after that, we're going to return to the quest for the ether. Thank you.